is quite high. I got it. Mm -hmm. Looks like our recording is going. Now, whether it actually gets saved, I'm not sure, but it has started, so. Great, thank you. The best I can do right now for you, Dr. Bloom. <laughs> I'm going to send it to the HIPAA people. <clears throat> and Dr. Blum, if you will, at the beginning, I want to take a couple of minutes of your time for a, a couple of announcements here, but. No, I'm, I'm, I'd like to hear them myself. Oh, you probably wouldn't, but. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a workhorse are you? You, you, you do more things and well, you, you have this vacuum that draws all these things to you. Is that it? I, I have no idea. I, I, I'm having to, I need to start following my own advice and learning how to say no. All right, how are we, how are we doing on numbers? We're getting up there. Andrea is another person who's uh, just has this open door on her inbox all day long. All right. She's another person who hasn't learned to say no. <laughs> All right. Well, we're. Let's see. We're starting to get up there. We're most of the way there, it looks like. Yeah. Well, in an effort not to take any more of Dr. Blum's time than I need to, I will go ahead and start with my couple of little things. So everybody, happy Friday. Glad to see everybody. Um, uh, a couple of announcements from uh, DCH. Um, uh, number one, uh, DCH is going to start or is starting to require face shields for everybody in the hospital. Um, it doesn't have to be anything special. You can find them in, you can find them a lot of places. I know several drug stores are selling them. They cost four or five dollars. Um, if you have any trouble finding one, uh, I think they will have some at the nurses stations that you can have. Uh, I, I don't know how many or what the, what kind of supply they have. So if you have access to something else, you might do that. Um, and this is just a policy they're putting in place based on CDC guidelines since Alabama is considered a uh, surge area. Um, they are encouraging use of face coverings. So are there any questions about that? I don't know if any of y'all had seen that or not. All right. My next DCH announcement that has apparently caused a little bit of uh, uh, uproar the last couple of days is about scrubs. I have talked to uh, Dr. Um, okay, hold it, I got a question. Uh, what's it say? Yes, so you we do need wear to wear both. A mask and face shield, correct. Yes. It is correct. Um, about scrubs in the hospital. I talked with uh, Dr. Ken Aldridge, who's the Vice President of Medical Affairs at DCH about this. Neither he nor I think that, that you guys are taking a whole bunch of scrubs or anything like that. However, DCH over the last three months has had a tremendous problem keeping scrubs. So I asked him what we could do to keep all of the scrub gurus happy at, at DCH and here is here is the plan. You are welcome to wear scrubs at DCH. You can take a set of scrubs home, home with you. However, they ask that rather than keeping scrubs at home and laundering them, take a set of scrubs home with you, bring the other set back in the morning, drop it in one of the hampers and let them process it. It seems like that would be trouble for them, but it's really not. They need to keep track of the number, num number of scrubs they have in circulation so that they can keep the right number. Over the past three months, they've been having to buy 900 new sets of scrubs each month. Um, so again, I know this is not you guys, but in order to make this easier on them and y'all, just bring those scrubs back each morning, drop them in the hamper, 
And then when you leave in the evening, if you need another set of scrubs, take them with you. Now, they, uh, Dr. Aldridge asked if it would be easier if they put a hamper on the fourth floor of the medical tower. Would that be a good thing? So that you wouldn't have to go back to the OR locker room in the morning to drop them off? I see some vague nods. So like wave your arms or something if that's a good idea. Okay, I got a few people. Anybody think it's a bad idea? All right, I'll ask them to do that. I don't know what, how long it'll take, but for now, if you would uh, process the scrubs, bring them back so that they can keep them in circulation and know that they're not disappearing. Are there any questions about that? All right, going back to face shields. Um, recommend looking for them. Well, I bought mine off Amazon. However, uh, I think I saw a something that said that either CVS or Walgreens was selling them for $4.50. You know, they say something helpful on them like face shield. Um, nothing fancy, but uh, but lightweight and comfortable and cheap. So if they get torn up, you could throw them away. But um, that that's where I would start is one of the pharmacies. Any other questions? If not, I will get out of here and turn everything over to Dr. Blum. Thanks, for, thanks for the time. Yep. Can it be like these? Would this qualify as a face shield or does it need to be an actual full face shield? Um, I think that those are probably fine because um, it's mainly eye protection that we're looking for. So I, I assume that those would be good. Yeah, I'm just looking at the announcement that came from DCH and it actually reads the universal use of eye protection. Mm -hmm. So you can use eye protection or you can use a face shield. Now, if you normally wear glasses, I don't know if that also counts to you, Dr. Stewart. I don't, I don't, I think from a practical standpoint, it probably helps, but no, it does not count. Okay. So if you wear prescription glasses, you probably have to get a face shield. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, thanks y'all. Okay, thank you. So, um, just a, a quick way of introduction, some of you, I think 11 of you, attended the Art of Medicine rounds last week with Dr. Blum. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with him, I just introduce him real quick. Uh, he attended both Amherst College and then the um, Emory University School of Medicine, went on and did an internship in internal medicine at McGill University, which is in Quebec, Canada, province of Quebec in Montreal. Um, then completed a family medicine residency and fellowship at the University of Miami. He's been an editor or associate editor of multiple medical journals, including the Medical Journal of Australia. And um, before coming to Alabama, was faculty at the Baylor College of Medicine. He's been in Alabama here since 1999, which is as long as I've been in the United States. And um, he is currently the George Leon Wallace Endowed Chair of Family Medicine here at the College of Community Health Sciences. He's also the founder and still currently the director of the University of Alabama Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society. Uh, he's been heavily involved in um, smoking prevention and education and was actually has received multiple awards from that American Medical Association's first award for distinguished service on behalf of America's youth. This was part of a doc program, Doctors Ought to Care. Um, American Academy of Family Physicians first National Public Health Award and really impressive is the Surgeon General's Medallion. And this was from C. Everett Koop. And C. Everett Koop is actually the person I still think of when I think of the Surgeon General. Growing up in Canada, when I was in my formative years, C. Everett Koop was the Surgeon General. He's still the person I picture when I think of the country's top doc. Um, Dr. Koop actually wrote, quote, Dr. Blum has done more against smoking than anyone. In addition to all of these medical and administrative appointments, Dr. Blum is also a self-taught artist. He's the publisher of three books of sketches and stories of his time as a physician about his patients. And his artwork has appeared in more than a dozen medical journals and textbooks. 
Um, so we are super thrilled that he's able to join us today in our Relate series. And Dr. Blum, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dale. That's great. I appreciate it. My mother wrote that introduction. I, but it, seriously, you, you did. Uh, it's good to know you. Uh, thanks to Dr. Stewart, who's done a fantastic job with our students, and uh, Dr. Clem, and Krista, and Dale. It's just an amazing team. I hope uh, people are as appreciative as I am. I, I've had for four years the opportunity to work with uh, one of the longitudinal students, and Annabelle's holding up that tradition already. Um, so it's it's a treat for me to have the opportunity. Uh, when Dale and I first spoke, I wanted to let you know about the Art of Medicine series that we have on the first Thursday of each month. Uh, Nell Williams and I started this in 2012 to try to look at a different side of, of the day-to-day uh, -day medical routine, uh, looking at some of the art in our lives that we don't often realize and looking at uh, music and uh, dance and sculpture. And uh, we've had playwrights and movie directors and um, all sorts of folks, historians. So um, we, we did have a lot of medical students initially. Dr. Avery was a big supporter, but over the years, people really didn't know much about it. So we're trying to uh, have a, a greater attendance. And thanks to Dale, uh, this past month, we, we did see quite a few students joining and got some good feedback. We have a very good speaker uh, coming up um, in August. He's a, uh, a classmate of mine from college who's a, um, a trauma surgeon, as well as an author of a jazz history of the saxophonist John Coltrane. And he's also a civil rights activist. Uh, and his father was a confidant of Dr. Martin Luther King. I don't know what to expect, but I'm gonna interview Dr. Tuffy Simpkins on August the 6th, and I hope you'll join us. And then in September, we have uh, Dr. Rick DeShazo, who is at UAB after over 20 years of being at the University of Mississippi. And uh, he has written a book called The Racial Divide of American Medicine. And I, he's just an amazing individual. So I look forward to your attendance at these and your input. And we've had students over the years that have given an art of medicine, but thanks to Nell and Andrea and Jackie and Pam, we really have a, a fantastic opportunity. And lately we've been on Zoom and that's actually drawn more people because we're able to go out all over. So my opportunity, uh, thanks to Dale, is to really uh, relate and share more of the reflective side of my life and maybe to the opportunity to give you a couple of tips um, I think that, that the key that I'm going to talk about today with my stories and sketches of patients is the art of listening. And um, also the language that we use. We get very quickly caught up in medical jargon. So I'm going to ask uh, to give it a try. Try not to hide behind medical jargon. You're in your best um, mode right now, really. Um, you know, before you get all imbued with, with the medical ease. Uh, I know that I often say to first year students that um, there's less of a gap between you and me, I graduated 1975 from Emory, than there is between you and your last day of college because you know you go home Thanksgiving your first year and people are already asking you to diagnose things. But the point is the word doctor is what you get when you come into med school because that means you're a teacher. And we're also students, I'm a student, I'm learning from you. So we're all learning all the time forever and that's just how it works. So. I think what we should remember is that doctors are teachers and leaders, that's the Latin meaning educare or to lead. We're not just proceduralists or prescribers and, and the patient is really what we have to center on. I hope that you'll never say that the patient is a poor historian because you're the one doing the history. And uh, I think it means that maybe you might wanna go back and check again and give the patient a time to think. And those yes and no questions are a surefire killer for getting any good history. So open-ended is the way to go. I, I present by occupation and not by race. I think, um, especially in the South, I, I don't see the benefit of presenting by race. There are a couple of conditions, you might say sickle cell disease. And the moment you say that, you're pretty much sure that that's probably an African-American patient. But you know we get caught up in, in race and I, I just don't see it. At Emory, I learned that that was really not relevant and I agree. Um, there's really a single history. I don't believe in dividing up the history into family history and social history. I think there's one history. And what percentage do you think that we learn about patients? Let's say history, physical diagnosis, and laboratory and imaging test. What, how would you, uh, let's just pick somebody 
you know, the first to call out, who would uh, guess what's the percentage of, of into a hundred of physical exam, history, and laboratory? Who's going to be the first on his or her blog? 60-20-20. Anybody, how about a second opinion? 60 is what? 60 is the? 60 history. Mm -hmm. Anybody go up or down? We're pretty much in agreement 60, 20, 20. Thumbs up, one thumb up. Okay, so it's, it's more likely 85% history and the other two divided equally. Um, I think physical exam is coming back, at least it was until the pandemic, but the point being is that we, we learn the most from our history. Um, you know, it's, it's what we know about patients and knowing patients is the thing. So um, what I'd like to do is, is basically just share some stories. And, and when you hear the phrase, tell, us, tell me a story, I think it's one of the most endearing and tender requests. As a family doctor, I'm blessed to care for patients who tell me stories all day long. And each of us in healthcare is constantly honing our story listening and our story facilitating skills. Today, I'd like to share with you some of my patient stories and the mix of emotions they inspire. Each story, I'm gonna pull up the slides here and um, each story that I'll show you, I'll share with you is accompanied often by a vignette or a moment or a sketch. I began doing this as a medical student. And when I'd sit in the outpatient waiting area and strike up conversations, with a person's permission, I'd spend a few minutes sketching him or her and jotting down our dialogue. My medium was simple, black ballpoint pen and prescription pad or whatever paper was handy, paper towels, notepads with ads at the bottom for aldactazide or Actifed and even the, the, the packages of gauze. We're so accustomed to the bustle, excitement, and challenge of a hospital that it's hard to imagine the stillness, solemnity, and fear found in the waiting room. So among the nearly 5,000 patients I sketched through the years, there were few smiles. There is, as one woman told me, much worryation. To me, a sketch uh, provides a necessary balance to the computer-based radiologic images that we count on and tell us what we think the patient really looks like. But to me, I can look at a sketch that I did as an intern, and it brings back the essence of that encounter. Each face surrounded by some jottings recalls a detail of personality, a conversation, an illness, and I see in them kind of fragments of the human condition. Uh, when was the last time any of us went to an art museum? And um, let me see if I can advance the slides. We usually have a little problem advancing, so I'm going to try to do that. Ah. Um, for me, uh, by the way, can we just do a show of hands? I can't necessarily see all the hands, but uh, how many people have been to an art museum in the last year? Ah, there's, there's a few. Andrea, could you be our pollster? Do we have a, a rough count as to how many raised their hands? What would you say? Now that your slides are up, it's hard to see everybody oh. at the same time. But it's, I mean, it's a good, it's a good group. Good, good. All right, yeah. we'll call you a good group. Um, when I was at the American Academy of Family Physicians meeting in, in Kansas City in 1977, as a resident, was called the National Conference of Family Medicine Residents and Students, I got bored. And I just started walking around Alameda Plaza, and I came across this magnificent uh, classical building, and it turned out to be the Nelson Art Gallery. I can't even recall the last time I'd been in an art gallery. I grew up thinking that museums are where they had dinosaurs, you know, because that's my thing. I wanted the science. But I walked into the Nelson Gallery and I walked up to this particular area where this painting was and I just, I just fell in love. I just started laughing. Because if you look at this, what's going on here? Here's a, a young lady uh, with all these guys surrounding her and there's, there's even a dog in the front there and this little kid looking up at the guy and they all look like stuffed shirts to me. But this was from the, the 18th century and it's by a painter called Gaspari Traversi. And he painted in what's called a mannerist style. He, he painted what was going on in, in real life back then. 
and he made fun of things. So this is a kind of a satire and it's called the art lesson. You know, they're trying to teach her a little art and um, I'm not certain that's their only motive there. It's a little easier to see in this one. This is called the music lesson with all these uh, pompous guys hanging around and the cat at the below the piano. And they're, they're looking more at her than I think they are at the music. But to me, I got so amused at this that I realized you can go to a museum and actually laugh out loud. And not, not far down the hallway was this particular painting. And it's called The Illness of Perrault. And Perrault was a, a classic uh, comedic figure in, in literature, uh, really a, a clown or harlequin. And you can see one of his buddies in the, in the back there with his arms against the wall. Do you, what do you think that guy at the back is doing? Is, is, what, what's, what's the emotion that that guy at the back is feeling with this sick person in bed there? Anybody want to call out something? It looks like he's trying to hide his face in his arm and, uh, and kind of turn away from the patient and the rest of the people. So he might be feeling sad or fearful. Yeah, it would seem that way, wouldn't it be? Yeah. But then the clue is you, you jump to the left there. And who's that lady on the left? Well, she's the cleanup person. And she comes in and she's looking. And you can almost see her face, even though she's not looking at us. She's just staring at disbelief. And who is she looking at? Who's the guy that's sitting there with all the fancy garb? It's a physician. He's got his stockings on and his hat and his cane. And he's, what is he doing there? He's got his hand and he's feeling the pulse and he's ruminating and he's thinking, oh my gosh, what is going on? And there's the sick person in bed there. But there's another clue as to what the illness really is. And what's that clue? What do you think the illness of Perot is? I can hear Kevin from the next room yelling it out, but I can't hear him on this. But Kevin, is, Kevin Bailey is the director of our Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society and a fantastic uh, individual. Uh, you, you were saying, you're still muted, I think. Oh, oh you're muted. Anyone want to call out what the illness is? So what, what's over here? What's in the corner? Models. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about a, a, a Pierrot who was inebriated and, and probably had, was a serious alcoholic. And what's the guy in the background doing? His buddy is, he's not crying or, or sad. He is laughing his, his heart out because this guy, the doctor, is an idiot and has to feel the pulse to figure out the obvious that we're dealing with someone who's got alcoholism here and not some fancy uh, thing. Actually, alcoholism is probably the most, the single most overlooked condition that we have, also illiteracy. I've had patients three or four years without realizing they couldn't read. But the reason for showing this, that very same day that I discovered this painting, I realized that we could laugh at ourselves, that physicians have often been a, a source of ridicule through the ages and not just a source of reverence. And they've even been, for many years, according to Daumier, the greatest French caricaturist, they were portrayed here as uh, the, the people of medicine. These were the, the doctors who looked at the specimens. And they're carrying the one, it, one is carrying an enema syringe. And uh, the, the one on the far right is carrying a bowl of urine. That's called uh, a piss pot. And he was a piss prophet. And, and Daumier is basically ridiculing physicians as being nothing more than a bunch of piss prophets. Um, the plague brought forth paintings, the likes of which we've never seen, these wonderful images of saints uh, helping people. And this was a saint, the saint of Milan, who was, uh, was uh, comforting people in uh, the 1500s who were made sick by another wave of plague. And uh, this graces the cover of the greatest single exhibition I've ever seen uh, called Hope and Healing, a painting in Italy in a time of plague, 1500 to 1800. So I think it's important to know that we're in something that none of us has ever experienced before. I've, I've worked through swine flu and, and uh, toxic shock and legionnaires and AIDS and resistant tuberculosis and SARS and MERS and a host of other things, but we're in something different now. And uh, 
during the Middle Ages, art was so important to people, most of whom couldn't read, but they would often carry around uh, entire paintings and look at them. And anyone who went into a building and saw this painting would recognize immediately the particular saint and the figure of Cupid, and they would take some comfort. Um, this is a different kind of era. This is coming from the 19th century, and it comes from Alabama. And this is a portrait of a little girl, little Margaret. Does anyone want to comment as to where and why this particular painting might have been made and uh, for what reason? A clue, is she happy, is she sad, is she, any, anything at all, let's, let's hear from somebody. Otherwise we gotta call out names of med students, I hate to do that. Taylor, you've always contributed, so we'll, we'll pass you, all right? But how about Mahabha, would you like to comment on what you're seeing here? Yeah, so she definitely looks pretty sad. Uh, I mean, she's wearing white, I would say it would be like a funeral or something, I'm not quite sure though. You got the sad right. Yeah. Um, this is a portrait of a deceased child who died around age three uh, from what's probably a malaria epidemic in Alabama in the mid 1800s. She is buried on the family plantation or retiracy it's called. And this was a subject of a cover story in Alabama Heritage some years ago. But I look at this and I melt. The painting was exhibited in Huntsville at the art museum there. And you literally just stare at it and, and you just, you, you break into tears how beautiful this particular painting is. In the latter part of the 19th century and early 20th century, um, well, actually in this particular painting comes from the early 20th century. Who, who do you think, or what do you think, or any, any impressions of that particular uh, artwork? Jada, you look interested. What do you think? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, to me, the way that the brush strokes and the lines and the colors are, I'm kind of getting more of a psychiatry vibe. Like maybe we're thinking this is an older gentleman, I don't know, possibly with some type of dementia, like he's not quite there, um, kind of in his own world type of thing. But what, not... what gave you a clue to dementia? <laughs> the way that he's looking, I'm not really getting, he kind of has this blank stare, like he's not, fully there. He's missing I feel like the emotion and expression um, of the face that most people have when they're facing the viewer. What a fantastic, I don't mean to sound patronizing, that's a great comment. In fact, it is a self-portrait by the painter Edvard Munch, the Norwegian painter, who himself was recovering at that very time he painted this of himself from what we call the Spanish flu. This was from 1918. Uh, I, I think that your insight is terrific. That's sort of what he's just in shell shock and he was not doing very well. He had a lot of sadness in his life. And of course his most famous painting is, does anyone know his most famous painting? It's the most famous painting ever by anybody. It's duplicated more by anybody. It shows the character like this. The scream. The scream. And um, Munch, Munch's sister died and that affected him terribly. She died of tuberculosis very young. And, and he painted a lot of portraits of people uh, suffering. This is not Munch, but this is another painter named Hodler who painted this portrait of his wife who, who was dying of tuberculosis. But this graces the cover of my favorite book called Medicine and Art. And we, ref we, we refer to this book often in, in art and the art of medicine rounds. Uh, I just, it's just the colors are so sallow and I mean greenish and it's really one of the saddest images I've ever seen. When I was in Houston in the 1980s, we were at the center of the AIDS epidemic. And um, we literally had the first and only AIDS hospital. Uh, my colleague, Susan Miller, became an AIDS physician. She left family medicine to go full-time into the care of patients with AIDS. And she taught us a lot. Um, the artist, Sue Ko, uh, was commissioned to come to Galveston near Houston and to paint a series of portraits from what we used to be called the AIDS ward. And this was the cover of the Village Voice in New York. And this was another one of her images of, 
uh, a patient with Kaposi sarcoma, one of the earliest ways we learned about this condition, something that we'd only seen in, in old men prior to the AIDS epidemic. Um, it, it's, it's just something worth uh, considering that when you portray um, illness in art, it's something that you can study and retain and help the next patient. Well, would you want to comment on this? This is perhaps not easily recognizable. Anybody care to say what that is? Maybe Peyton, you're looking at that very intently. I waited till you had your mouth full. I was gonna say, it looks like a histology slide. It is indeed. That's a biopsy. And uh, you can see some blood vessels up there, I guess. And it doesn't look good to me. I'm not a pathologist, but uh, but there's something really beautiful about this particular uh, image. And it reminds me, well, here's another one of plasma cells um, that could well be a multiple myeloma. But I just look at these slides and I see art as does another one of our students. Um, and uh, Lily Mahler, who is an artist and in this week's issue of Pulse, which I hope you'll all subscribe to for free. It's called Pulse, or and you can get it by emailing or by uh, Googling pulsevoices.org. But this appears in this particular week's issue of this weekly humanities publication called Pulse. And here's what, uh, what uh, Lily wrote. I find myself in a strange reality. At the start of the COVID-19 crisis, my institution temporarily dismissed all medical students from clinical duties. Going from actively participating in daily patient care to pursuing an entirely online curriculum has been challenging. After the endless Zoom meetings, repeated rescheduling of board exams, reports of rising case numbers and the loneliness, worry and uncertainty of it all, I seek solace in creative outlets. Through art, I can visit swirling oceans, sherbet colored sunsets and summertime butterfly gardens, all from the little desk in my apartment. Creating these colorful images makes me smile, if just for a moment, before returning to reality. I hope they will bring viewers a small bit of joy as well. And here's a physician in the Adirondack Mountains by the name of Daniel Way, who has produced an entire book of his scenes and stories from his Adirondack medical practice. This is, my, it's my favorite area of the world. And I, I just, I, you could swim in a different lake every day for years. Um, and he's taken portraits of his patients through photography and shared a little bit of stories with them because he makes home visits. A North River centenarian. I thought that's just such a beautiful way to put it. Benjamin Franklin Cleveland, what a story. And here's an artwork on the cover of the Journal of the American Medical Association by an artist called Mae Lesser who got her degree in her master's degree in art as it turns out from the University of Alabama and who embedded herself for four years at the University of California at Los Angeles to look at the medical students learning medicine. And she did hundreds of drawings and pastels and paintings, and this is one of them. And we have in our library, when it's spanking new, the new version uh, coming back to life, um, you can see one of May Lester's artworks that her family donated to us because I went online to find out more about her. And it turns out that her family is interested in uh, having her work be remembered. And she's probably the only person on earth who embedded herself with medical students, not at one, but two universities, the other being Tulane, where she followed students in their process of learning. And here perhaps is the painting that most epitomizes American medicine. It's um, a painting by the late 19th century painter Thomas Aikens in Philadelphia. And um, the Gross Clinic is the name. And you can see this surgeon, you know, he's got the scalpel is probably, if you look close, there's probably you see blood on it. And you'd see the, the, the lady in the corner whose, whose son is being operated on, and she's just in horror. They say that, that Aikens is somewhere in here uh, doing the painting, but it's, it's considered so important in American medicine. This was given in honor of Dr. Gross by the students of uh, the Pennsylvania College of Medicine. And this portrait was about to be sold by the college because the college was having some financial difficulty. But the citizens of Philadelphia raised $68 million to save this painting, where it now hangs in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But my favorite painting is the painting by Goya, the uh, 18th and 19th century Spanish artist who came ill with a very serious illness that was a mystery. 
It's a mystery. He uh, may have had an encephalitis. He may have had some uh, Guillain-Barre, may have had something that nobody is quite certain of, but he lost his hearing and he nearly lost his life. And this is his uh, portrait uh, that he painted of himself with his physician, Dr. Ariada. And last summer when I went to Minneapolis to speak at the National Conference of Tobacco and Health, I had an hour to go to the Minneapolis Museum of Art and I had no idea that my favorite painting was hanging in that museum. And I saw it from the next gallery and I spent literally one full hour in front of this painting. Um, I think you could describe all human emotion. It's the physician who's the vulnerable person here and it's the doctor that's portraying strength. It's the doctor that's offering not just medicine because maybe we didn't even have medicines back then that would treat this, but that doctor was offering the comfort and the touch that that patient needed. That's my death. He was a general practitioner in uh, New York and he loved the practice of medicine from the 7 a.m. hospital rounds to the after supper house calls. His office was in our home where every afternoon the living room became the waiting room. His favorite day was Monday where he could start the week anew, seeing patients in the very place he'd been raised, Rockaway Beach, New York, home of Jonas Salk and Burl Crone of Crohn's disease fame. But it wasn't just his knowledge, his clinical skill, his compassion, or his love of medicine that most endeared him to patients. Rather, it was his way of speaking, down to earth, sprinkled with humor, listening closely, making small talk, asking questions that showed he cared. Where are you from? Who's at home? What do you do? What do you like doing? He never lost sight of the patient's world beyond the examining room. He was a kind of environmentalist, learning the nuances of the ever-changing neighborhood, picking up on slang and dialect and teaching himself Spanish. He had some Puerto Rican patients and one day I came home and he was repeating the same phrase over and over. I said, dad, what is that? What are you saying? He says, please pee in the bottle, please pee in the bottle. I mean, he, he loved getting to know new groups of patients. He'd stop to talk with the hospital handyman, the priest or the policeman. And I think he felt that to be a good doctor and know how to give just the right advice meant learning from them in their environment too. When he passed away, when I was a senior in college, I came across a telegram that one of his patients had sent my mother, who attended the University of Alabama, I might add. Um, this was the telegram. Myself and two young boys were the doctor's patients. Please know you have my sympathy. Dr. Blum was a beautiful man. He a good doctor and wonderful human being. Must be proud, dear lady. You have my prayers and tears. A good doctor and man comes but once in a lifetime. So today, I I'd like to just sort of demedicalize and undo the technology and let's just sit and gaze and prolong the encounter and let's keep our eyes and our ears wide open and be aware of the concerns patients have aging and anxiety and technology and sexuality and dieting and AIDS and death. By the way this was his letter of internship offer and notice it said he had a compensation of fifty dollars a month and full maintenance. You will have to furnish your own uniforms. So I couldn't risk overlaying my own letter of acceptance to internship at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal with the same Gothic uh, typeface. And uh, I never, he never had a chance to see me as a physician, but uh, I, he was my role model. So at McGill, I, I started a kind of diary. Um, it, it, it contained little sketches and newspaper clippings and jottings. And every day I'd come home and sort of paste things in there. I kept this up through my residency at Miami and uh, th these are just a couple of pages to give you an example. Um, and um, I'm gonna close up, show some of these particular images, such as um, this was a group of patients that I uh, sketched over the years in waiting rooms. And I submitted them as, a, as a, a collage to the Journal of the American Medical Association, which published them as a, as a, as a, a group. And I, and I basically said that in the, um, uh, you know, I was describing the, the mood of the emergency room. I was looking for my description. Um, basically the fear that I tried to capture because I don't think we, we appreciate uh, just how difficult it is and how stressful and how solemn it is for people to make that leap to go to the hospital. I know we have a lot of African-American patients who literally are still scared to go to DCH because of the treatment that they believe they their family members experienced prior to the Civil Rights Act that enabled care to be less segregated and open to all. 
Well, here's a typical patient that I sketched in my internship. Uh, he was a fighter. And he said, I wrote in the margins that he fought Griffith, who was the middleweight champion of the world. And he would take his hand like this and he'd smack his head because he had a metal plate in there. And he, uh, uh, it, just, it was just a moment that I remember vividly all these years later. Or this lady said to me, I came in early today because I had this weird psychic feeling you were running on time. And she told me about her mother. They had my mother in hospice, she said, for a year. But she wasn't terminal enough, so they terminated her. And this lady said, I like older doctors. They seem to talk to you more, just like you talking. Younger doctors seem to be in such a hurry. I had one doctor used to have to chase and grab on his white coat, flipping up and down the hall. You want to ask him something, you have to run him down. I don't sketch kids too often because, you know, they move around too quickly. But I often say to children, what do you do for a living? And, you know, the, the answers you usually get are, well, I stay in my home and play, or my job is to take care of my toys. But I had one little six-year-old girl, cutest thing in the world. I said, what do you do for a living? And she goes, doctor, I am a child. A lot of times, times you come into the room, and, and if you have a tie on, they say, oh, you, 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 I see you've been going to church, or uh, are you the principal? And this lady was 96 years old when I asked her the secret of her long life. And, and she thought a minute, and then she looked up, and she said, I tended a cow, uh, and I, I, I'd be out in the opens a lot. Her name was Molly. And then she added, my friends are all years younger than I am, but I think I am still younger than they are. On the other hand, there's this lady who said, there are not many advantages to being from Laredo, Texas. What can you do for my age? It'd be better if we could just evaporate. We all might elect to evaporate a little bit sooner. I don't know whoever invented old age, but I'm against it. Or this lady who said to me, I'm older than I look because I worried myself to death all my life. It's, it's, it's truly sad how people um, um, really, you know, this is the sign. They put their hand on their forehead. And this lady said, a doctor I saw didn't know anything about polio. Said it just weren't her generation to know nothing about it. I can't remember that doctor's name as many bills as I got from her. And making house calls is a great privilege. I learned from my chairman, Dr. Lynn Carmichael, that you want to go and you want to excuse yourself to wash your hands. And um, by the way, I can't resist saying when Annabelle and I were seeing a patient the other day, we were talking to her on the phone and she has COVID-19 and we were looking up uh, what to do for it because I'd asked her, what did they tell you to do at the Urgy Center? And she said, well, they didn't tell me anything. Just drink plenty of fluids. I said, surely we've got some more specific recommendations. I like Progresso broth and Jello and comfort foods and, and on and hot tea and lemon and grapefruit juice. But she said, no, nobody told me anything. So we looked up on websites. What do you do? What do you? And it's the same thing. Every single website, drink plenty of fluids, get plenty of rest. But there's one website that started off differently and it was the OCD Foundation. And I swear you, the first sentence of the OCD Foundation for what to do with COVID-19, wash your hands frequently. Go figure. But this doctor, this patient could never um, seem to get his blood pressure where we wanted it. And when I did excuse myself to go to the bathroom and I opened up the medicine cabinet, sure enough, there were all his medicines in chronological order, unopened, filled with the medicine that I had prescribed. He done good. Or he told me once, you done good, doctor. It's the first time a doctor ever broke it down where even an old country boy can understand. Because the first time I'd seen him, he went to me and said, whoa, I, I, you got to talk to me like you're not in school. See, my other doctor, he never explained. I had to go through the grapevine. He, he, all he did was give me a lecture. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not a doctor. You have to explain. You have to draw me a picture and color it. And here's a man who was so frightened. He was 79 years old. He was just uh, cringing. He had the, the, the blankets almost up to his eyes. First time he'd ever been in the hospital. And he needed, because he had a terrible anemia, a hematologic consult. But I forgot that the hematologist had just arrived from Australia. A little hard to understand sometimes. He was so nice, though. I, I wanted him to come and see this patient. But sure enough, he bounds into the room and he said, hello, did you come into the hospital to die? And, and, and you, if you'd just seen the expression on the guy, what do you mean die? He said, no, 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 not to die, to, yes to die. To, and he got, it was just, it was, but when we calmed him down, he was able to do well and he got out of the hospital and he would come back and talk to me and he, he had his little habits and he would say, I bought a juicer. I eat plenty of juice, only I put vodka in it. 
sometimes when you got a cold, you take a drink to go to sleep, but when you wake up, you got a cold and a hangover both. And one time I asked him, could I take your blood pressure? He said, you're gonna give it back? Often lesions are clues to people. This lady has a condition around her eye called herpes zoster ophthalmolicus. And when she got better, I, I had the chance just to chat with her. And she said one day, she says, I'm feeling old, ain't like my mother. She and I was walking and somebody said, we look like sisters. Well, a compliment to her maybe, but not to me. Her name was Lester. And I said, uh, how'd you get the name Lester? She said, well, my mother and my father picked out a girl's name and a boy's name. My identical twin sister, Virginia, got the girl's name. Asking people their names is a very good way to break the ice. And this lady was named Portia. And I said, Portia, how'd you, what do you know about that? And how'd you get, she says, well, I Googled myself and I'm a deadly spider that kills its mate. A song by Miles Davis, the album's called Turn, a town in Arkansas, population 457, a brand of birth control and a moon around the planet Uranus. And this was a mother and daughter. I couldn't quite ever figure out who was who, but I just thought they were so lovely. And here was a lady who wouldn't leave the hospital. She had a pain in her shoulder and she just didn't want to leave. And she wanted and she demanded what we used to call a nuclear magnetic resonance image. We now call it MRI because we got rid of the nuclear because it sounds too scary. But no sooner did we send her down to the radiologic area that she started screaming and disrupted the whole place and demanded to go home immediately and stopping the test. So I was elected to go down and to calm her down and to find out what was going on. And this is what she said. I had an old cousin. When I came on the ship to New York, he said, I want to take you to Howe Caverns. But when we got there, he only bought one ticket. I said, why? He said, you're not taking me underground. I'd be going there soon. And that stayed with me no underground trips. So when they put me in that tunnel to do that test, I got so scared, I started to say the Lord's Prayer. I asked God to forgive me for things, and I told him to stop the test. So doctors, when you're planning trips, don't take old people underground. So sure enough, not long after that, I took my son on a trip to look at colleges in upstate New York, and I actually swear, look what we came across, how caverns. I said, well, we've got to go in and with that spooky lighting, you can imagine how scary it really is. Um, but, you know, that's, that's what she felt. Um, this was uh, a dean of Emory in the 1950s. I had the honor of meeting him when I applied to med school. He was on my admissions committee, and I got to know him quite well. He actually was a geriatrician till his mid-80s, and his name was Dr. Hugh Wood. And he was the first Harvard-trained a uh, medical internist at Emory. Uh, he was the chief resident in, in medicine at Emory in the 1920s. And I asked him um, what it was like the moment you realized you were going to be a doctor and a good one. And here's the story that he told me. I worked for a summer with Dr. Martin L. Dalton. It was the end of my junior year in medical school at the Medical College of Virginia. I'd like to tell you about one house call we made. Well, he was a man, his wife and his little girl all sick with a fever in August. Dr. Delton took the temp temperatures, felt the pulse, pulled off his coat, rolled up his sleeves and said, y'all got typhoid fever here. Well, we gave an enema to one that was distended and did some things that he gave instructions to do. And we inquired who in the neighborhood had had typhoid, wasn't afraid of it, could come look after them. Then we drove another couple of miles and got a neighbor to come minister to these three sick people. Going back home in the Model T, I got the courage to ask, how'd you know so quick they all had typhoid fever? Well, he laughed at me for a mile or two, and then he said, I suppose you want the Weedall test to detect typhoid bacilli in the blood and the blood's cultures and the stool cultures. I answered, yes, because those were the things I thought you had to have to know about typhoid. But he said, it's just a typhoid house. No screens on the windows, flies all over the place, pigsty above the spring so it could wash into it. It's just a typhoid house. Oh, bring your tube when you come back to see him next week and get your specimen. I did, and that weed all test was positive. And when I interviewed Dr. Wood, when I graduated, he was concerned about the overemphasis on technology. And that was before MRIs and before CAT scans and forgetting the patient. The patient, he said, will tell you what's the matter with him if you know how to listen. Not always, but frequently. And then he added, the thing that makes a good doctor doesn't come out of a medical school or a hospital. You know where it comes from? His home. 
and his early environment, maybe his pastor, somebody he loves and trusts, somebody who, who's confident he'll be worthwhile. And here's a patient who underwent a procedure and got very, very frightened and shared the experience of his cardiac catheterization. Lying on that table, scared, bothered me more than the procedure. That board they had me on looked like a cross. Then they hogtied me when the heart doctors were ready like paratroopers to come in. Or here's this other man saying, well, let me tell you a little story. I had a little pain in my chest here. I don't know where it was gas pain or not. So the doctor took one of those electro things with all the wires and he said, well, it looked good, but I need more tests. So he sent me for an x-ray like a movie and he looked at my heart and say, it okay, but I'm not too satisfied. I wanna hear it. So he took me in a room and listened with a microphone and says, I'm not too satisfied. And he went and stuck a wire up my leg on TV. I could see the wire in my heart poking this way and that way. It's all right, he says, but I'm not too satisfied. So he sent me running on that moving sidewalk and more tests. And down the line somewhere, he said, well, you're all right, but here, take this medicine anyway. And she was so scared, we were just going to do a simple laceration suture. And she said to me, she says, you, you just better go ahead and do it now because I am mentally prepared for you all to kill me today. I had a patient tell me what it felt like to have a mammogram. She says, you know what that's like? Put your boob on the driveway and tell your boyfriend to back his pickup truck over it. I had a patient that told me, uh, I shared this with Dr. Stewart the other day, that he said they operated on my knee and they trimmed my hibiscus. It ain't much fun to go to Weight Watchers and get up on that scale and see that you have paid to gain weight. A lot of people have this problem and are concerned about it. One lady told me, I figured it out, I'm 329 pounds and at my weight I should be eight foot seven inches tall. So I'm not fat, I'm short. I asked the lady though, how'd you lose the weight? And she put her head down and said, well, I lost my dad. And this man who I made the mistake of saying, um, how'd you like that no salt diet I put you on? He just glared at me and he said, well, sort of takes the sting out of dying. I asked this lady um, what she thought of, of the medicine. I said, we're gonna give you a medication that we think can stop your seizures. And she just looked at me and said, I don't know why, it's the only exercise I get. So I used to have migraines all the time. Then after I got rid of my first husband, I didn't have them anymore. I asked her if there are any problems at home. She said, oh, just the usual shit with my kids. One's a dope head, the other's 17. And after this patient at the clinic told me he had been disabled from a stroke he'd had eight years before, I asked him what he did before the stroke. And he, thought, he said, well, I, I did a little bit of everything, a uh, little bit of cocaine, a little bit of marijuana, a little bit of whiskey. And this 93-year-old lady was always feisty. We had to constantly bring her into the room because she was always bickering with her 58-year-old son who'd be wheeling her in. And she'd always start the first comment by saying, I think I'm dying, doctor. And finally, I asked her, why do you always say you think you're dying? And she turned around, she said, well, to please him for one thing, grieving. This woman was on the examining table and she just started crying. She had had an anencephalic baby, but she was actually quite grateful. And she shared the story, probably the most grateful patient I've ever met. She knew about the baby, but she determined she was going to deliver the baby that they wanted to uh, abort. He lived 12 minutes. I wanted him to live long enough to be born, to let his four grandparents hold him, and when it came time to die, he would die in my arms. We were granted all three of those things. And this isolation in hospitals, people who, this woman never even spoke to us because she couldn't speak any English, hiding you know, behind a mask and now with gowning up with COVID as we did with AIDS. Um, this was a woman I actually attended to at home. She had a terrible lung cancer and um, she just, really wanted to be there at home and not wanted any more treatment. She had this wonderful repose. Masks and masks and this woman was unrecognizable. I sketched her in an operating room. And this man was in the ICU for a long time. We, we tried to convince the woman that was by his side, his wife, that he wasn't doing well, but she insisted and of uh, doing everything we could. And, and finally, I asked her to tell me about what was going on in her mind. She said, when he had his automobile accident, 29 year old, years ago in Louisiana, 15 inches of plastic a aorta, punctured lung and all that stuff. The Lord performed three miracles. He lived, he was able to walk, he went back to work. I'll be there. I've been there 48 years. Um, 
I've cared for a lot of homeless patients. Uh, this was one of them. When you see a patch of, of, of a forest or, or even a traffic island in Houston, chances are somebody is living behind there. And I would often make house calls into what seemed to be just a little patch of, of brush. And uh, this is where many of our patients lived. I, I met a, a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley, a banker, a, a man who, whose sister was a physician with whom I worked a gospel singer who'd won a star search competition, but spent the airline money on drugs. Uh, it, it's just, well, as one nurse who was homeless told me, I'm in the homeless field and it's a lot harder job than I was doing before. But I had this wonderful patient named Carrie who had no street sense whatsoever. And he would sleep on the streets and get beaten up regularly rather than go to the shelter. And, and, and I asked him why, and he told me he'd been sent to the state school when he was a child to, as he said, to balance my checkbook and, and dress myself. I mean, he was a little off. And, and he told me one day that he learned to read him by himself. I said, how'd you do that? He said, Sesame Street in Vanna White. And I said, really, can you write? He said, oh, they say I write just like a doctor. Well, Carrie was this wonderful angelic person. And one day I said, what do you do with your money? You won't come to the shelters. He said, well, once a month, I go to the Houston Ballet or the Houston Opera where I love to watch the stories. Well, we got Carrie a little job. Warren Holloman, my colleague who ran the, the search homeless shelter, got him a little job. And on Christmas, he came back and gave me a gift. It was a, a calendar of ballet dancers by Degas. And patients with Alzheimer's disease, as we begin to wind things down here, um, you know, this, this is really the coming epidemic as well. A, a, a mother just described, a daughter described her mother as just like another child that I have to childproof the house for. I asked a lady one time, did you swallow your pill? And she said, yeah, I heard it hit bottom. I asked her, do you know where you are? She said, I think I'm right here. It's, it's really sort of touching. And a nurse who cared for patients with Alzheimer's disease told me once, I know they're trying to tell me something and it's not what they're saying. I come up with several words that might kick in because their face will always light up when I hit the right word. I have one lady who I love. Is that you, baby? My baby, she asks. Are you my baby? She just gets a big kick out of me. If they have a worried look, you just smile. You respond to their faces and the tone of their voice. You just try to put them at ease. And our patients with AIDS. This is Hector's mother describing Hector's AIDS. He clean a birdcage and he get wore out. He's so outcasted and alone. Actually, he didn't really tell me. He gave me a pamphlet when in my mind, I felt something wrong all the time, something wrong with him when he come home sick from New York. Doctors wouldn't tell me anything. Doctors say, he'll have to tell you. And that time we weren't talking about AIDS. This was a shame and this was a shameful thing. And this was really one of the tragedies. You not only got sick, but you, you couldn't talk about it. And another young lady who died from AIDS. And just lastly, I'll share the story of this woman who actually from, was from Uganda. And she told me how she'd gone to the emergency room. I was in the emergency room Sunday morning. My nerves boiled, my head about to blow up. They told me it was anxiety and gave me pills. I don't want pills for stress. I want my husband to say good things to me. I want to be loved. At home at dinner, he, he, he sits there. He's very quiet. He has his hands on his lap. So last night I said to him, can you use your hands to do other than sit on your lap? Put them around me. I want to feel it. If you make me feel it, I can be healed. Sweetheart, you can heal me. I don't need pills. You all I have and I'm all you have. I said to my husband, relax my head and talk to me. What should I say? Oh, put something sweet in my head that I can go with to bed. And he did. And I slept very well. And this man said to me, doctor told me I needed an autopsy, but I said I wanted to wait. And she said, you made me feel better. Let me tell you all about my life. May the good Lord take a liking to you, but not too soon. Love to hear a couple of comments or questions or criticism. I see you, Paris. I love Paris, the city, and also would love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, no, I thought that was all really great. Um, I attended the past art uh, medicine rounds this past. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was really interesting. And I think I love art. I'm not artistic at all, but my sister loves to draw things and she 
there's a lot of sketches and portraits of me and my family. And so something really interesting to me was how you um, tied in like the histology slides uh, into it. Cause like, I don't see art in histology, but you know, the way you can see it, you absolutely can. And it's just the way that you want to look at it and your perspective into things. Um, so I think there is a lot of art and medicine that we choose to look over and we don't see it as an art when it actually is. We, Paris and I rehearsed this before you got here. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. The, no, really, that's, that you couldn't have said it any better. When it hit me about those slides, it was when I saw a Jackson Pollock painting, you know, the splatter paintings. Take a look at Jackson Pollock and you'll see histology. I, I would have loved going into uh, pathology, but I'm more interested in, in the, the stories and people. Um, I switched from internal medicine to, to family medicine because internal medicine it was just too much of a candy store. It is the coolest thing in the world, but it's really disease centered. You learn so much every day, but really you learn more about the patients and the people and their personalities and what makes them tick in family medicine. That's a little paid political announcement, but um, the, the pathologists get this beautiful artistic view. And Lily, when she said she was thinking of surgery or pathology, it, I knew instantly because she has an artistic eye that she would love pathology. And I think that's what she is going into. We do have maybe a moment for another comment or two. I'd love to get any feedback. Uh, I have a rare opportunity to use this. Um, maybe I might do this particular talk a couple of times a year. Um, and I've, I've done it since the early 1990s when Dr. Warren Holloman, who we had as our last art of medicine presenter, we're already talking about having him back, um, started a series called Compassion in the Art of Medicine. And Warren inspired me to share these stories with his med students, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, I have something to say. Please do. Yeah, um, I really appreciate how you uh, chronicle your stories with uh, drawings. Um, actually, my first patient, or one of my earlier patients, uh, I really liked her, and I asked her, like, what advice she has to give me as a future doctor. And she basically said, listen to your patients, uh, listen to more than just coming in for uh, 20, 30 minutes in the morning at like 5 a.m. waking them up, you know, go back in the afternoon and actually like have a conversation with them. And I just really appreciated that because she herself was a school teacher and she was saying how um, she really appreciated me coming back uh, because she was going to get discharged in the next uh, few hours. I just wanted to say my goodbyes before she uh, went back to her family and enjoyed her time. Uh, so it was really nice of her to say that, um, appreciate that I came back to her and give me the sage advice of, you know, take the time to listen to your patient a little bit more, even though if it's not pertinent to treating the current disease, it's very important to give them a, um, something to, you know, for them to tell them because especially in this time, they can't talk to their family in person. So she just appreciated that. Wow. And I can see how like, you know, you chronicling each patient's story, how that can be like, you know, on a different platform as a way to keep those stories alive. Thank you. I, I actually would only disagree with you on one thing. I think you did make a difference, even though it wasn't necessarily immediately related to her condition, that did help her condition. I think patients hang on our every word. I don't ever use the term, by the way, chief complaint. It's a negative. I try to look for the concern. And often you have to layer that. They're not gonna always tell you. They don't tell the person that answered the phone and they made the appointment. They didn't tell the nurse that roomed them, but they might tell you if you dig deep enough. And particularly men who don't like to go to the doctor. But you betcha that cancer and now COVID and other things are in the back of people's minds. And often you might have to articulate that. But I know uh, Lee Thomas, uh, who is now retired, was a surgeon at DCH and two members of my family uh, were his patients. And he would come into the room every morning. And I stayed a week with my son on one of those awful beds. And Dr. Thomas would come in and it was as if he had all the time in the world and he'd lean back. And he literally didn't spend any more time with us than he spent with any other of his patients. But he, he was able to create the notion that, that his time was our time. On the other hand, we had a phlebotomist who'd bang open the door every morning at five and say, hello, good morning. Not what we wanted to happen. If you look at ICUs, I think the studies have shown that the average person is awakened 54 times in a 24 hour period. Sleep is so important. 
but thank you so much. I didn't get who actually made that comment. Was that? Uh... Uh, yes, um, my name is Gaurav. Thank you. It's yes. all right. I, this is my second Zoom talk like this, so I don't know who's uh, um, watching. But I, I do want to acknowledge Dale. I know I think we may now finally be running a little over, but uh, if there's other comments for the good of the order, anybody else uh, help me out or suggest or comment? I want to thank uh, Andrea again and Nell and uh, Dale and Krista and uh, Dr. Clem and Dr. Stewart. I am so honored that you came and tuned in today. It means a lot. It helps me to share stories and to learn from you. I look forward to getting to know you and to answering questions and being available. And we're very grateful that you took time to talk to us today, Dr. Blum. Thanks, Dale, for suggesting it. Okay, I hope everyone has a good day. Have a good weekend and um, let me know if there's anything you need. Thank you, Dr. Blum. Thanks, Dale. Thank you. I noticed Dr. Blum in the background, you have a poster there for Philip Morris. Um, yes. Philip Morris, the Philip Morris company was one of the first people to give me a grant when I became a professor. <laughs> and unfortunately it, it was a little bit of a career killer. Once people saw I had money from Philip Morris, even though it was part of an extramural grant program, it was not intramural, it was extramural. Um, and it was, actually a, it was actually to look at electrophilic compounds in tobacco smoke and how they cause lung damage. Uh, as soon as people saw the name Philip Morris, that was a strike against me. Well, I still love you, and that's what counts. Um, but I think quite seriously, I'd love to get that story. I, we have, I, just this week, by the way, on Wednesday, there was a meeting sponsored by Philip Morris on improving uh, race relations in America. I mean, they hadn't skipped a beat. Um, I, I, was, I was virtually at the Philip Morris meeting, shareholders meeting this year at both of them, because there's international. And um, they're making money hand over fist. Don't ever feel sorry for Philip Morris. They were proud that 92% of their Marlboros were still being manufactured in spite of the pandemic. Wow. Well, yeah. thank you. Uh, hope that we can give you a tour of our tobacco center as well. Absolutely. Um, I'll come over sometime. Look forward to it. Thanks. Good. Have a nice weekend. Bye now. Thank you all.